All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Made Perfect Through Sufferings. Made Perfect Through Sufferings. So I get the title of the sermon from uh, this passage in Hebrews 2. We'll just read it again from verse 9, where Hebrews 2 verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Thank God for that. For it became him whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Perfect through suffering. So made perfect through sufferings. And the thought I want to just convey to you guys this morning and I want you to consider um, that good can come from bad. Good can come from bad because obviously... You know, we are in a terrible situation that we find ourselves in. I don't think we have it as bad as people have had it in the past, but we definitely find ourselves in a terrible situation and in oppressive times. And I just uh, was reflecting on that and thinking about the good that has come out of this situation. And what do I mean by good? I mean good as in people are now thinking about Um, the impact of politics on society. They realize the power that politicians have on their freedoms. And they're waking up to these things. I mean, even the people in our own church, think about it, guys. I mean, are you now not more uh, cognizant about things that are happening in the world? Are you now not more worried uh, about, you know, laws that are being passed and our privacy and our freedoms? And I mean, who would think that, you know, one day um, meeting for church would be illegal. One day that, you know, going soul winning would be questionable and, you know, all these things. And I think uh, this is what's the good thing that is coming out of this, that it's making God's people just a little bit uncomfortable because you know what, guys, we've just had it too easy for too long. And when we go through a bit of suffering, we go through a bit of trials and tribulation, when life gets a little bit harder, then we just we don't take the things that are nice and pleasant in our life for granted. You know, whereas we were. A lot of people were taking these things for granted and now they realize how fragile freedom can be. Maybe next time you won't take it for granted. You know, I wonder. Um, you know, we had lockdowns a year ago and you wonder, did, didn't that make you perk up a bit? Didn't that make you wonder? But, you know, that lockdown came and went and then people just went back to their life. So it required, did it require a second lockdown for God to get our attention and for us to do something about it? Um, maybe it did. So uh, I'm thinking about the good that is coming out of this, that sometimes hard times wake people up to actually do something. And maybe you know, we've had it too good for too long that we need to go through some hard times in order for people to appreciate um, things that are truly valuable in this life. I know uh, this, uh, this uh, I don't know if it's a poem or a saying, I don't know who it's attributed to, but uh, generally when people are talking about this cycle that happens of good times, they, they talk about uh, this phrase, you know, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. That's the society that we have been living in. And weak men create hard times times. You know, it's funny that, uh, you know, people always say that, you know, the good times are generally run by capitalism, right? Capitalism and free markets create the productivity in a society. And that, you know, that lends the way when people don't understand where that productivity comes from and this mindset that government just has infinite money. Remember, government collects it from the private sector through taxes. So capitalism and free markets generally create the productivity that these leftists and socialists and communists can then start saying, well, give out all this stuff. And then once all the money's gone, then capitalism has to rise again to save the day and actually create things of value because productivity is where wealth comes from. So it seems to follow this cycle as well. And, you know, this is where we are now. We're back here where we have some hard times. And I'm trying to think about the positive here that hopefully these hard times will create some strong men and women. And I'm hoping that these strong men and women 
come from within our midst and maybe they're listening to the live stream this morning. So hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. Made perfect through sufferings. Let's look at some other examples from Scripture this morning. Some other examples of Scripture where the Bible talks or has a positive perspective on suffering, on trials and tribulation. First of all, we'll go to 1 Peter 1.3, where Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, writes here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye, re wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, look, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Notice how Peter talks there about the manifold temptations. The, what does he say here? The, the heaviness that you go through, the trial of your faith. Look at this, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. You know, I'm sure many of us, when we think about the hard times that we go through, through. We'd, we'd rather, you know, gold and silver, you know, prosperity and, you know, going, things going well. But Peter's saying here, no, 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 the right perspective to have is actually when we go through hard times and how that tries us and molds us is actually much more precious than the gold and the silver that we can amass. Whom having not seen, verse 8, ye love in whom, though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All right, so Peter there talking positively about the trial of our faith, going through manifold temptations, many types of temptations and great heaviness, right, to mold us. A Job 23, you know, famous example of Job, right? Job going through the trials and temptations that Satan put him through. But look at what he, when he reflects on the stuff that he's going through before he's broken down, right? Because as you read through the chapter, he starts breaking down more and more where he starts losing, you know, his faith is really getting tried at the end. But here where he's still really saying some good things at the beginning, Job 23, 8, he says, Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. Who is he talking about here? He's talking about God. So says when he's going through hard times, sometimes he doesn't think that God is around, right? I go forward, he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, right? So it's like he knows that God is working. I guess it's, you could say that he knows the knowledge, but he's starting to not believe it here, where he feels that he's not around, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You see, made perfect through suffering, this refining through going through hard times, improving something through tribulations and persecutions. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I not kept and not declined, neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. You see there that, you know, Job being tried brought him closer to God, closer to the will of God. And, you know, I think that's a good thing to reflect on in the sense that that's what hard times can do. But it can't end there, right? We need to, to move on. It's just good that it wakes people up. It gives people a change in perspective and makes them think differently. Mark 16, 15, we know the Great Commission. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But you know, when you read through the Bible, when you read through the book of Acts, the disciples were not so good at obeying this command. Why? Because when Jesus told them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, what did they do? Well, they stayed at Jerusalem and that church just kept getting bigger and bigger and they were preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. But I remember he wanted them to be witnesses unto him, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So a lot of people believe, because obviously it's, it's not stated in the Bible, but a lot of people believe that the disciples, like many Christians today, are just getting a little bit comfy in their own home, comfort in their own comfort zone. So what did God do? What did God do to make them obedient unto the command to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Well, he sent them a little persecution, didn't he? Acts 8, 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Who this was uh, Stephen when he was stoned. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad, went everywhere, preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I won't read the rest of the chapters where I'm going to stop, but if you are familiar with your Bible and you know Acts 8, Acts 8, 37, you know, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest, you know, when he preaches to the eunuch and the eunuch goes back and, and he gets baptized, would that have happened? if God didn't send persecution to the church at Jerusalem, because that's the reason why Philip went down into Samaria to preach the gospel. So you see here that there was good that came out of it, um, where they were getting a little bit comfortable, and God had to send some persecution their way to get them to actually do what he had commanded them to do, which was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look in James 1. I don't know if you've ever put these passages together, but this is where James is writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, right? Because this is after the church has been dispersed because of the persecution on there. James writes, A servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Now look at the first thing he addresses when he talks about these tribes that are scattered abroad. And we saw that uh, were there in Acts 8. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. He says to them, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, right? Whole wanting nothing, not lacking anything. So there's that same principle there, being made perfect through sufferings. And sometimes we have to go through that suffering in order for us to be perfect or strive for perfection and, and try and walk um, as God would have us in the image of Jesus Christ. Let's look at some um, examples from the Old Testament. Let's see how, show you how you know, God deals um, with his people uh, in the Old Testament, uh, which was Israel as, the, as a shadow of the true people of God, which are believers. But Deuteronomy 8, let's read here. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So you see how God allowed, he, he sent them through the wilderness, he put them through some hard times, and what did it do? It tested their faithfulness to God. And does that not, it tests to see, you know, when you go through hard times, are you, do you truly love God? 
You know, people say they love God, they love God, and when things are easy and things are going well, yeah, they're at church. They're, yeah, they're serving God. Yeah, they're doing everything right. And then when things get hard, that's when you realize how many people are actually faithful to the Lord. So this is what God does. God sends these trials and tribulations to humble thee, Right? We talked about people being reminded that, you know, this, this life is not all there is and being reminded, hey, I better do things like as per, as per God wants me to do and to prove thee, to test you, to know what is in your heart, whether you will keep his commandments or not. That's what Deuteronomy 8 is talking about the nation of Israel as they went through the wilderness. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You see how they had to learn this lesson through going through the wilderness, through the trials and tribulation. Why? Because sometimes good times is not always the best teacher. And sometimes good times, you know, our fleshly nature, it's natural for us to take these things for granted when we're prosperous, we forget about God, when things are going well, we don't think we need God, we don't think it's important because everything's going fine. So it just requires a little bit of hard times for you to go, well, maybe fighting for things like church and our religious freedom and fighting for these things actually is important. It is important for me to get involved. I can't just keep ignoring uh, the world going to crap while you know we're just happily prosperous and working our jobs and working our businesses and going on holidays and doing all that stuff it's time to wake up and realize that the world is you know this 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 world that we once took for granted is leaving us and we better do something about it before it's too late judges 3 verse 1 uh, we see here as well even after they went into the land Again, God uses these hard times to bring them back to him. Judges 3 verse 1, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the walls of Canaan. You know, I read this passage and I remember many years ago I read this passage and then it just, you know, clicked with me that, you know, people always wonder why God allows Satan to do what he does in the world. And it's like, why does Satan, you know, he has his devils, going about their business and people say like, well, why doesn't God just remove like Satan and remove all these things and then everything will be fine? Well, that's the problem because if he removes all those things, everything will be fine and then you'll take things for granted and you, you know, you won't appreciate and, and, and there's nothing to prove you that you will be faithful to the Lord. And, and this is what he's saying here. He's like, he leaves some of these godless nations amongst the land of Canaan and amongst the people of Israel to use them as thorns in their side to remind them of how to fight and that there were fights and that, you know, that, that he can use them to oppress them if need be so that they will call back to the Lord. Verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel, look at this, might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. You know, I like to say when we... When we live too uh, easily, you know, you think about, um, you know, nations that have had to fight for their freedom. You know, they appreciate it a lot more. And here where people grow up in a free land and in prosperity, they forget how to fight. So it's interesting here that, you know, we live in a prosperous land and everyone, you know, scoffs at, you know, the right to bear arms and all this sort of stuff. And God is saying here that he's left these nations in this land so that Israel doesn't forget how to fight and, and doesn't forget about war and how to defend a nation. You know, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Namely, five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hermon, unto the entering in of Hamath. And they were to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So this is what I, why I believe God you know, uses Satan, uses his devils, 
in this spiritual war, because I think we're given some insight here as to why he left uh, those wicked nations amongst the nation of Israel. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served their gods. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their God, and served Balaam and the groves. You say, Victor, that's pretty bad. You know, they, they're serving other gods and committing idolatry. You know, we don't do that today. But don't forget, the Bible says covetous, covetousness, which is idolatry. Right? So we may not make a statue and bow down to it, but we certainly put our career and our monetary, monetary aspirations higher than God. And, and we see that in this society. So there is a form of idolatry that goes on in our society, whether it's work or whether it's sport sometimes. You know, people very religiously follow their sports and their hobbies and interests. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Chushan Rish Athaim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Chushan Rish, Rish Shethaim eight years. So notice they're getting oppressed now for eight years. Verse 9, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. You see there that when they went through hard times, that's when they cried unto the Lord. But it make, makes you wonder, when they weren't crying unto the Lord before, they were serving idols. They were ser God made them go through some hard times so that it would bring them back to Him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Him. <clears throat> and He judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Chushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into His hand, and His hand prevailed against Chushan Rishathaim. And the land had rest 40 years. I mean, that's encouraging that they were oppressed for eight years, but then when somebody was raised up to lead the nation of Israel and to bring them back into peace, they had rest for 40 years. So, yeah, hopefully that's the sort of cycle we're on. You know, that maybe this is only going to go for a couple of years, but then maybe after that we'll have a few decades of peace and freedom. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So you see how, like, you know, we need leaders to rise up, you know, because they need to lead the people. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gerah, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. So, you know, if you don't know that story, you should go and continue to read Judges and um, some very interesting stories there through the Judges about how um, the nation of Israel was delivered. And obviously that's where we get the story of Gideon from as well, from Judges. So we see here this theme throughout the Word of God that... We are made perfect through sufferings. That we, that's why you know, people always ask the question, why does God allow suffering? Well, one, is the, one of the main reasons why God allows suffering is because ultimately it makes us better. But you need to have faith in God's Word to know how things can improve through hard times. You know, it's, it's, some, it's, it's interesting that this is one of the main reasons why people reject God, reject Christianity. But yet... It's, it's not even something that only Christians believe. I mean, if you just look at any sort of sex, success talk or talking about excelling in any area, they talk about having to fail and having to go through the hard times and having to go through the no and the rejection and how it builds character and it builds resilience and all that. And then these same people that worship all these worldly, humanistic success speakers and everything, will in the same breath go, well, why does God allow me to go through all this suffering? Well, it's the same principle that when you go through suffering, it makes you better. But it's just that 
you know, we can have an eternal perspective where there may be hopeless situations in the physical world where people may die or people may have disabilities and it makes it seem unfair, but then having the eternal perspective is what puts it all in perspective in God's point of view. So made perfect through sufferings. Now let's just talk about some, just want to have some practical application now to the scriptures that we've talked about. All right, so three things. And it's nothing new, but I think it's always a good reminder of what is our purpose here? Like what, what can we do as Christians? Because you may be looking at the world today and thinking, you know, what can I do to make a difference? And, and really those steps are quite simple, not easy, but simple. But I think it's a good reminder this morning. How can you make a difference in this world? Well, number one, I know it's point number two, but number one of the three things I want to tell you, first one is you need to grow spiritually. See, any change you want in the world, it's going to have to start with you. You know, you have to, you can't just depend on others to make the change that you want to see in the world. It's got to start first here. It's got to start first with God's people, with you amongst God's house, making the difference first in your own life, right? If you're not working on your own spiritual growth and your own spiritual maturity, how do you expect to make an impact on the world, make a spiritual impact on the world? 2 Peter 3, it says here in verse 17, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. What is he saying here? Take heed lest ye fall. That's what Peter's saying here. He's saying, beware, be careful. Be aware of the things that will lead you away from God, lead you away from the truth, and go to the error of the wicked. The things that the wicked people do and the purposes and the goals and everything that they want to accomplish, the, the priorities they have in their life, and you fall from your own steadfastness. This happens too often amongst Christian people where they want to take the stand. You know, they want to do what's right by God, but over time they're not, be, they're not being wary of these things and they're being led away with the error of the wicked, the wrong ways, and they fall from their own steadfastness. Verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. See, so you need to grow spiritually. I mean, obviously, first of all, you need to be saved. You, know? so you need to be saved so that you realise there's more than just this life. Right, that's going to change your perspective, first of all, that you know, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe there's a God. You believe there's an afterlife. You believe that there's heaven and hell. So being saved, first and foremost, uh, changes your perspective. But not only saved, he says here, he says, grow in grace. Right? So this, this is talking about your character and your love and things like that. And he says, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, you can't, you can't be growing spiritually when you're still just as ignorant about God's things as you were before. You know, growing spiritually is not just like, well, I just feel so much more connected to God. You know, I just, I just feel so much more spiritual. I'm just like, you know, it's all based on my feelings. And then it's like you ask the person, well, have you read your Bible? Do you know how to explain things about the Bible? Do you understand why you believe certain things? Do you understand why this is right and this is wrong and why we do things? And it's like, well, I don't really know the Bible that well. Well, then you're not growing spiritually because my, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You can't be growing in grace and in the knowledge if you don't have knowledge of God's Word. So you've got to have knowledge of God's Word. Don't deceive yourself into thinking you're spiritual just because you feel spiritual, just because you're Christian, that you don't know anything about the Bible. You know, you've got to know the Bible. You're, that's, a, that's a definite measure of how spiritual you are. 
when you're growing in the knowledge of God's Word, right? This is how you know how much of God's Spirit do I have, you know, in me? And I'm meditating on God's Spirit. It's like, how much of God's Word do you have in you, right? That's, that's, that's the, 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 the physical manifestation of God's Spirit in this world. It's the Word, right? That's why faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, spiritual things. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So you need to be learning. You need to be learning things and learning God's word, learning things, learning more things. You know, the more you know, the more difference you can make in the world. Right? The less you know, the less difference you can make. I mean, ignorant people don't make a difference in the world. I mean, they may be they're ignorant in terms of ignorant of the truth, but they're knowledgeable about the things that they're trying to push, right? They need to convey these concepts, especially in a democratic uh, type of society where you, you need to convince people, right? So you want to make a difference in this world, you better get some knowledge, you know, and get some skills in communication and talking with people. Look what the Bible says here in Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you see, you're tra how you transformed? You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, you would see things differently. Why do you see things differently? Because you read God's Word, you understand God's Word, and now you're seeing things through the eyes of faith in God's Word. You see the world differently. Right? You understand differently now because you, you know, you're renewing your mind. Right? You have a different perspective. So what I mean by growing spiritually, growing spiritually is going to mean that you know, your purposes now are going to be different. You know, when, you, when you reflect on what is the purpose of my life, Hopefully things have changed from when you weren't saved or when you were work, walking in ungodliness and you had a purpose and then you know, you're trying to walk in the Spirit, you're trying to have a spiritual purpose in your life. Your purposes are going to change. You know, why you believe God has you here on this earth when you're growing spiritually. So when your purpose changes, the reason why you believe God has you here on this earth, your priorities are going to change. Right? And when your priorities change, then hopefully you'll make more of a difference and a positive impact in this world. When you grow spiritually, you're going to have less vain things in your life. I already, I already mentioned some of them previously in this sermon. But you know, as you grow spiritually, not only is your purposes and your priorities going to change, but the vain things in your life hopefully will reduce so that you'll have more time to spend doing things of God. But you know, you'll only make this choice if you're growing spiritually. Right? You grow spiritually and you slowly change, you know, with God's help, to have different purposes and different priorities and then starting to do different things in your life. And you know, when you grow spiritually, those things that you thought were once so important or so entertaining start to diminish as other values start to take hold in your life as you walk in the Spirit. But not only that, growing spiritually is talking about, I'm talking about gr like gravity and maturity. Just growing in maturity as people where we take life more seriously. You know, we take the things that are important in life more seriously. This is why, you know, as you grow older and as now some of you are starting to have children and your children are growing older, you know, you're starting to have different priorities and purposes and different values in your life because as you mature, right, and, you, and you're less naive about things, you start to realize things that are important in this world. So this is where we want people to grow as well. We want to grow in maturity. We want to grow in, in gravity, right? Because if we want to make a difference in this world, we want people to take us seriously, right? So if they take us seriously, we're going to have more of an impact on other people, less self-centeredness right as we're growing you know we're going to be praying more when we grow spiritually we're going to have more of a servant's mind we're going to be thinking about more what what can i do to make a difference rather than i need to make sure 
that I experience all the pleasures that I have set out in my life before I leave this world. You know, that's a very spiritually immature way to live your life where you're just hoping, oh, before I go to heaven, I want to try and enjoy everything I can on this earth. You know, you're going to be thoroughly disappointed when you get to heaven and everything in heaven is just a million times better than anything you can enjoy in this life. But I think the perspective that we want to have in this life is what's, what's the most I can do for God while I'm here on this earth because there are things that I can only do while I'm here on this earth and those things are, are going to be an opportunity in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that, you know, once you die and go to heaven, you'll never need to preach the gospel again? <laughs> you know, because everyone's going to be saved. So it's, it's like there are things that, that, are, that, are, that can only be done while we're here on this earth. Because when we go to heaven, that, that job will be over, right? The night will have come. So we need to be praying more, have more of a servant's mind. We need to be growing spiritually first and foremost. Second thing is, second thing is we need to make sure that we are teaching others. You see, it's not just enough to stop at step one. It's not just enough to, for you, that yourself is growing and then you, you know, you're getting more mature and you're learning more and you're being more knowledgeable. Some people have that perspective on Christianity where they think, well, they're going to church, they're growing, and you know, they're in church every week and they're learning. It's still a very self-centered and less impactful way to live your Christian life. Why is that? Because we need to be spreading the influence of God on others, right? And the only way we can do that is if we proactively try to teach others and reach others. So, you know, we need to go from just growing ourselves spiritually, and we need to turn into being somebody who's discipling others. We need to become a teacher to teach others. 2 Timothy 2, look at what Paul says to Timothy here in 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able also, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So you see here, when Paul was commissioning Timothy or encouraging him and exhorting him, to be faithful to the Lord, it wasn't enough that just Timothy was growing in the Lord and Timothy was doing what's right. He's saying to Timothy here, well, I also want you, the things that you've heard me do among many witnesses, I want you to not just do them, but I, the same, he says there in verse 2, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also teaching others. I mean, that's part of the Great Commission, right? That we teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you and lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Amen. So teaching people is part of the Great Commission. You know, it's all of our job to be part of the Great Commission. That's not just preaching the gospel, right? That's also teaching others how to preach the gospel, Right? But the problem is, you know, the Bible says, but a faithful man, who can find? I think there are people like myself that are perfectly willing to try and commit thou the things that I've learned to faithful men. But it's not always easy to find faithful men, unfortunately. So we need people to rise up and be those faithful men and make sure that we commit that to other people and commit to them to, to commit to other people as well so it doesn't stop at them either. And that's the same thing we need to tell our children, right? We also need to tell our children that we're not just teaching our children and it just stops. We need to teach our children to teach their children and teach them to teach their children's children so that it keeps on going. So we don't go, we can, we can maintain, you know, the, 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 the type of life that we have today and these freedoms that we have to, to keep worshipping God and serving God. Deuteronomy 4 verse 5, look at this. Behold, 
I've taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So he's saying to them, look, you've been given laws and commandments, like we've been given the Bible, that are you know, much better, you know, much, uh, I'm lost for words right now, but much, you know, held, should be held in much higher regard than just the other laws of other nations, right? Because they're given by God directly. They have, a, they have a sense of wisdom that the other nations won't have because they're not given by the true God. Verse 7, For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? I mean, aren't you glad that, I mean, I can, I, when I think about the, the nation of Israel saying here, it's like so great that they had the, the great, the perfect laws and, um, you know, the great nation and why is God so nigh to them? And that's how I feel about, you know, Christianity and church. That, you know, we can say that, you know, what other organization out there, or what other religion out there can say that they have a God so nigh to them and, you know, a book like, like we do and statutes and judgments like we have where we can confidently stand on them and defend them. You know, we don't have to teach Christianity through ignorance like the Muslims do, keep all the Muslims all ignorant about, you know, all the stuff that Muhammad did and all that stuff, you know, but then, yet yeah, they're so much more zealous than we are, right? And here, it's like the nation of Israel, they had the greatest laws and yet, you know, there were other nations more zealous than they were about their traditions and things like that. It's, um, it's a sad thought. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. Look at this. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. They may teach their children. So we have to teach others. So not just others, you know, to teach others. You know, we need to learn more so that we can convince others. Uh, we need to make sure that we teach our children as well. We teach our children to understand why we believe what we believe and to teach them to teach their children. That needs to be something that is important. You know, so many parents these days, they think they've taught their children their job is done. No, their job is not done, right? Their job is to help continue to teach the generations after them, right? And to keep on teaching. And we need everyone doing that to reinforce the things of God and the values that God has onto the next generations, right? So this is why you need to know what you believe so that you can teach Others, you need to be learning more to convince others. You want to be a mentor to others, but you're not going to be a mentor if people don't take you seriously. This is why you need to grow in maturity and in knowledge so that people can look to you as a mentor, right? We need more faithful men. Be an example to others. You want to be the change you want to see in the world and you want to teach your children. See, we need to be teachers as well as doers, right? This is not the same thing. Yeah, you want to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, but we need to be teachers and not only doers, right? Because a lot of people that do, they don't necessarily learn how to teach others how to do because the qualities you need to do something is not the same qualities that, that you need to teach somebody something. But we need to be both doers and teachers but you know the sad thing often is that people are not teachers because they're not even doers to begin with right because you can't teach something that you never that you don't do right it's very difficult you know to to, to teach people how to do something have that real world application when you don't do it yourself so you need to do in order to teach but you don't want to just be doers you need to be we need to be both doers and teachers 
The last one I want to talk about, this is what we're talking about now, to being the doer. Volunteer your services, right? Do the work. Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as, having, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, we often talk about this verse in terms of there being plenty of work to do uh, and not enough people to do it. But it's interesting here that the, the, when Jesus actually mentions this, you'll notice that what he's reflecting on is the fact that there are so many sheep but there's nobody to lead them, right? So the people that will do the work, you know, and get into the harvest, even if others aren't, they are the leaders. They're the ones going for setting the example, right? And that's what is lacking, right? What's lacking is leaders rising up to say, you know what, I am going to do it even though others aren't either. But, you know, most people are sheep. And unfortunately, the sheep, uh, scattered abroad, having no shepherd, they're waiting for that leader to rise up, to get behind. And you could be that leader that is that example amongst your circle of influence. So the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And that's the same problem when it comes to anything that is lacking volunteers. Uh, so you want to make a difference in this world, grow. You need to teach others, but you need to get involved as well, right? You can't just look and complain like we've done for so long, right? Just complain about what's happening in our society. It's time for us to get involved and volunteer our services and help uh, make a difference in this world. James 1, I mentioned, I alluded to this, but let's read it again. James 1 verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. We need to help with the work. But, you know, we need to be wise with how we invest our time as well. You know, so, you know, it's, I, this is not just about just, you know, well, I've got to do something. So you just get involved in like anything that comes your way. Somebody asks you to do this, you do that. Somebody asks you to do that, you do this. And, then, and then you just spread yourself so thin that, you, you know, are you even being productive now? You know, or you may like burn yourself out. So you need to think about, you know, what is it that you need to accomplish? What's the, the most productive way to accomplish that? And be productive in that harvest, right? Because some people, they just help out anyone else. And, and really the problem there is they just don't know how to say no. So you, you need to know how to say no in your life because there's always a million and one things to do. Right? Think about all the causes that are out there. There's a million and one things to do. But you don't want to get involved in every single fight because you just don't have the capacity to do so. So you need to think about what are your talents? What are your abilities? What are your interests? But also, what's the sort of impact you're trying to... Is, is that making a change on society? And are we going to invest our time doing that? Yes, you can do a few different things, but you don't want to do... You don't want to be righteous over much. Right? You don't want to spread yourself too thin because you end up diminishing the impact you can have. So you want to be wise about where you invest your time. And you know what? Like if you can't give of your time, you, know, you must consider donating to the cause. You know, some people, they say, well, I'm so busy working that I can't get involved in this, that, and the other, right? 
Well, at the very least, you know, if you're spending all your time making money, then use some of those funds to donate to causes that do make a difference so that at least you can fund the people that are in the fight, like the Bible talks about. And no man that, you know, that, that goes to a war goes of his own charges, right? So those of us who are trying to make a difference in this world, starting a business or working or having a career where you may, you know, operate through the corporate world, you make sure that you are giving some of those funds that God, that God has given you the power to get wealth through those means that you then use some of that wealth to further God's kingdom and further good causes in our country and in this world. So money and time are the same thing, if you think about it, because it takes, it takes time to make money and money really is just a measure of the productivity of your time. So whether somebody gives time or whether they give material possessions, that's how you can give to the certain causes. But I would put a higher value on um, volunteering versus giving. Why? Because the harvest is plenteous. What did Jesus say? But the laborers are few. Right? He didn't say the resources are few because ultimately when it comes down to doing the work of God and making a difference, nothing, I, I don't think anything is more valuable than somebody who's you know, filled with the spirit that's principled, that, that can take that stand and have that influence. Right? Money cannot buy the influence that somebody can create. Right? But if somebody has influence, obviously money can support the work that they're trying to do. So I would put a higher value on, um, on volunteer work, right? On people actually getting involved and putting their name to something to further it. So just in conclusion, just as a reminder, so one, first one is you want to grow. Second one is you want to teach others. And the last one is you want to do. And just going back to why we're talking about this, right? Why I'm encouraging you to take these steps is because you know we are going through some hard times and I hope that these hard times have woken you up to do something. So don't let it stop at just murmuring about the hard times. We need to be made perfect through sufferings, but we need to take that suffering, respond the right way, you know, take those heaviness and that manifold temptations, respond the right way and actually do something in this world to make a difference. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for the reminder that Jesus Christ, our perfect Savior, was made perfect through sufferings. Lord, we pray that we will follow in his footsteps. And Lord, through the hard times we find ourselves, help us, Lord, to grow, uh, grow in knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to make a difference in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.